If you learn something, that's knowledge. You need to spread that. And that's something that you may benefit from after your death. Wallahi, wallahi. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas right now in his grave is benefiting from the fact that we're learning this hadith. And that we're seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these words that he taught his son who taught the rest of the ummah. You don't know. Perhaps you teach someone this dua and they teach someone else. And it goes on. And you may be getting reward, rewarded in your grave a thousand years from now, two thousand years from now because of something that you thought was, was simple. And the Prophet والسلام, said, perhaps one of you just says a word, a good word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Even though he deems it to be insignificant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of it raises his darajat. So we shouldn't take these things lightly. To learn the learn these dua and teach it to others. Like, nah. Oh Allah, very I seek refuge in you from al jubil cowardice. And I seek refuge. Take it one by one. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. al jubil al jubil Which which incidentally is the same word for cheese in Arabic. And some people, if you go online, they translate it, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cheese. Wallah. And that's the importance of actually having some understanding of the deen. Nah. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. Allah, many al Min al-jubin. Nah. And I seek refuge in you from al-bukhul. Okay, and this is the second thing. I seek refuge in you from al-bukhul, which is? Can you translate? Stinginess. Nah. Miserliness. Stinginess. Nah. And I seek refuge in you from being returned to stability. Yeah. Okay, and I seek refuge in you from an uradda ila al umr, which is a, which is comes from the Quran, and it means going. It means going back to a decrepit age. Why does it say going back? What happens when a person gets older? They start getting what weaker and weaker and weaker. When a person is first born, they're weak, and then they get what? Stronger and stronger and stronger until they hit a, until they hit a pinnacle. They hit a high point, and then they get weaker and weaker and weaker. He's seeking refuge and going back to a weak state where you become decrepit, where now you are just like a child. You have to have someone change your diapers, even though you're a grown man or a grown woman. And so the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this. Nah. And, and okay, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. That's, it's important that we understand these concepts and why we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from these things. But, but that will be for tomorrow's discussion because we're only going to cover the first two today. Nah. That's number three, by the way. Nah. And I seek refuge in you from fitna to dunya, the nah. trials of this world. And, and, and I seek refuge in you the trials and the afflictions and, and the temptations of this life. No. And the punishment of the grave. No. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Adab al Qabr. Today we're going to focus on number one and number two. And it's the, the dua starts out like this Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. If you can memorize that right there. Uh, that's going to recur four times in this dua. And in fact, this whole book is dedicated to how to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the duas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where he sought refuge in Allah. So the majority of these duas start off with Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Alright? So if you can memorize that part, then that's half the battle. Alright? And by the way, this book, for those of you who can, can look for it, can you read the title of the book, Shay? It's called Explanation of Supplications of the Prophet وسلم, related to seek refuge in Allah. Okay. Explanation of Supplications from the Prophet. وسلم. This is a six part series. Explanation is seeking ref uh, explanation of supplications of the Prophet. And then each one of the six is dedicated to something different. So this one is dedicated to seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu had a number of supplications where he sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them are dedicated to, one series is dedicated to, uh, it's called a sabah wal masa. Those dua that the Prophet sallallahu specifically made 
in the morning time and in the evening time. Another one is dedicated to what are known as comprehensive dua. Okay, so it's a six-part series directly taken from the book in Arabic known as Fiqh al-Ad'iyya wal-Adkar. And if any of you even know a little bit of Arabic, it's a book worth having. It's called Fiqh al-Ad'iyya wal-Adkar by our Shaykh Abdul Razak bin Abdul Muhsin al-Badr, who also teaches here in the Prophet's Masjid. And it was translated by Shaykh Abu Muhammad Abdul Rauf Shakir, who's a graduate from the College of Hadith here in Medina. Now, the first, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, O oh Allah, verily I seek refuge in you from Al-Jubal, cowardice. Until seeking refuge from cowardice, which is the opposite of Al-Shaja'ah, courageousness. Okay, so let's stop here. Allahumma, inni a'udhu bika min al-Jubal. All right, I want you to say it. Allahumma, inni a'udhu bika. Inni a'udhu bika min al-juban. Min al-juban. Okay. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. Allah, I seek refuge in you from being a coward. From being scared when there's no reason to be scared. This doesn't mean that if you are on a safari tour and you see a lion or something like that, he's very close, that you shouldn't be scared. It's talking about being a coward. You see something in front of you that's not right. And you have the ability to say something or change it, and you don't. And you don't. Why? Not because you think it's going to lead to a greater harm, but because you're just scared. Because you are more scared of that person than you are fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and standing in front of him for not doing what is right. And so you find some people won't pray on time. Maybe they're at work and they don't want to, why? Because they're scared of what their co-workers are going to say. A'udhu bika min al-jubin. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. That's cowardice. Now, which is the opposite, which is the opposite of, as, uh, as our Sheikh says, being courageous. Nah. Being fearful of things and hesitating from doing them. Nah. This is the result of a weak heart okay. and fearful nature. Where does cowardice come from? It comes from a weak heart. And that, and that is why we seek refuge in Allah from cowardice. Because a person who truly embodies the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. His heart is attached to Allah. He fears Allah alone. He hopes in his reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He loves Allah azza wa jalla like he loves nothing else. <coughs> He's not going to shy away from doing whatever needs to be done so that he can practice his deen, so that he can help others practice the deen, so that he can call to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he loves Allah, Azza wa Jalla, and he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's not worried about what is going to come as the result of doing what is right. Whereas a person who does not have that strength, they're always trying to be people pleasers. They want to please this one, or please that one at the expense of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's cowardice. That's cowardice, not This is the result of a weak heart and a fearful nature. And this is from among the blameworthy characteristics which are not befitting to be found in a mu'min. A believer is not a coward. It's just, it just doesn't mix. And if you feel like that, if you feel any cowardice, when you feel scared, say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al -bukhar. If our Prophet والسلام, who received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he taught his companions to make this dua, you, you just have to imagine. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who was making this dua, right? He was nothing of a coward. And he made this dua because this is reinforcing, reinforcing his shaja'ah, his, his courage, and that he is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second. All right. So that dua, that first part of the dua, memorize it. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-bukhul. 
And if you can't say min al-bukhl, then say from cowardice. Just make sure you make it a part of your routine. Min al-jubin. Min al-jubin. Min al-jubin. Nah, we'll get to bukhl. Allah min ya'udhu bika min al-jubin. Oh, Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. Nah. The second. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, and I seek refuge in you from al-bukhl, stinginess. Until seeking refuge from stinginess. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Again, again. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from al-bukhl, from being stingy. Yani, a believer is not stingy. And subhanallah, and it manifests itself in different ways. It manifests itself in different ways. The opposite of, and so when you're seeking refuge in Allah from something, you're, it's inclusive, and, and it implies that you are asking for the opposite. And the opposite of being stingy is what? Being generous, being generous. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with seeking refuge in Him from being stingy, that Allah blesses you to be generous. And as we're in this month of Ramadan, we should be looking towards always trying to embody the characteristics of the people of taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on multiple occasions, when He describes the people of taqwa in the Quran, he describes them as people who give from what he has provided them. They're generous. If you look at the first description of the people of Taqwa in the Quran, where does it come? Alif Lam Mim Dalik Al Kitab La Rayba Fi. Who Dalik Mutaqi? Alif Lam Mim. This is that is the book about which there is no doubt. It is guidance for who? For the Mutaqi. You say in this month you're fasting so that you can be hungry. You're fasting so that you can be thirsty. What are you fasting for? So that you can attain taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the muttaqeen al-ladheena yu'minuna bil-ghayb. Wa yuqeemuna salata wa mimma razaqnaahum yunfiqu. Those who believe in the unseen, they establish the salah. And from, we, from what we have provided them, they what? They spend. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the heavens, about, about Jannah. The width of which is the heavens and the earth. It's been prepared lil muttaqeen. muttaqeen. It has been prepared for the muttaqeen. What's the first thing he says about the muttaqeen? Alladheena yun fiquna fi sarra'i wa darra. Those who spend at times of prosperity and times of adversity. You can't be stingy and be from the muttaqeen. It doesn't work. If a person is stingy, their stinginess is taking away from their taqwa. There's a reciprocal relationship there. So, if a person, the more generous a person becomes, then the more they are fulfilling that aspect of, of a taqwa. Nah. The minimum is zakat. I'll tell you what, I'll talk about that right now. Is it still seeking refuge from stinginess, which is to hold back that which is obligatory? Or nah. denying the one? Okay, which is to hold back that which is obligatory. This is the worst form of stinginess. To withhold that which is obligatory. The wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with, there are rights attached to that wealth. Meaning that it is not all yours. Part of it is zakat. So if you have any surplus wealth, any savings that, that you've had, that you've held for over a year, you have to pay zakat on that wealth. If not, you are being bakhil. You're being stingy. Likewise, if you're married, your wife has rights over you. You have to spend on your wife. You have to spend on your children. You may have to spend on your parents, depending on what their income is and depending on what your income is. These, this may be an obligatory form of spending. So you're seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being miser. Nah. Or denying the one who begs the surplus that one has with him. So a, a person may ask for wealth. And you, and you know that their situation, or, or at least you don't know that they are unjustly begging. Some people, um, and, and unfortunately in some countries, it's almost like a, a mafia operation. Where there's a person at the head, of the, of the organization, they cut off the limbs of children and they make them go beg. And then they take the 
they take the, the wealth from those children and maybe just give them enough so that they can live on. We're not talking about those type of operators. We're talking about somebody who genuinely needs, and he asks you, and you have surplus wealth that you don't prevent them from that, that you give them what you can. None. Or that one does not give anything. None. Or perhaps one doesn't give anything. Yeah, I mean, all of his wealth he uses for himself. And he doesn't do anything to, to show any kind of generosity. And you know those kind of people, subhanAllah, who uh, when you go out with them to eat or something like that, they're never going to pay. You already know before you go out. They're never going to foot the bill. Best case scenario, they go Dutch, and no offense to the Dutch people here. That, that's not a good quality. And it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that you should be the one that pays all the time, or that the other person is the one that pays all the time. But there shouldn't be that kind of apprehension to be generous. SubhanAllah. And especially during the month of Ramadan. Especially during the month of Ramadan. But, but again, Ramadan is not something that, that comes and goes and, we're, and we go back to who we were before Ramadan. Ramadan is a time where we improve, inshallah. We develop good habits. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're at a heightened level in Ramadan, but it doesn't mean that you know, you're stingy before Ramadan, inshallah, Ramadan comes, you're generous, and then you go back to being stingy again. No, it, Ramadan should help change certain aspects of, of your character. Nah. And this is from the characteristics or qualities which are blameworthy. Nah, that is to withhold your wealth, to be stingy. This is also not from the characteristics of the believers. Nah. Allah the Most High said, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَبْخَلُونَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ هُوَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ بَلْ هُوَ شَرٌ لَهُمْ and let not those who covetously withhold that which Allah has bestowed on them of His bounty, wealth, think that it is good for them, and so they do not pay the obligatory zakat. Nay, it will be worse for them. The things which they covetously withheld shall be tied to their necks like a collar on the day of resurrection. Nah, so that's because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, and, and, and this is uh, something that comes frequently in the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying, don't let those people who think that, that by being stingy, huh, that they're actually gaining wealth. And, and that's what happens a lot of time. A person thinks that, okay, if I don't pay uh, for dinner when we all go out, then I'm going to actually be saving some money. No, if you do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're in fact depositing that money and your hereafter, which is where you really need that commodity. In this life, you know, money comes and goes. There are people who are rich one day, poor the next, and then rich again. And that's just the, the nature of life. But it's more important about what's going to happen when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, uh, again, and I didn't realize we were going to take this much time with the dua, but I think it's important that we recognize, especially in this tremendous month of Ramadan, the importance of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, for those of you who make hajj, sometimes you find that a, a person starts out on the Arafah and he's very enthusiastic. You know, they pray Duhur and Asr combined. And then he goes and he's making dua and he's pouring his heart out. And after 10 minutes, he doesn't know what else to say. He's done. And it's still five hours left. And he, he's done. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what to say, what to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. The more of these prophetic du'a that you memorize, it's going to take you, if you memorize the prophetic ed'i, it would take you a couple hours just to get through. Take you a couple hours just to get through the prophetic ed'i. So you take it step by step and learn them more and more and it'll help you and your ability to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that the Prophet sallallahu did. Other than that, as we spoke about yesterday, there is nothing that is equivalent to the du'a that comes from the heart, and the du'a that comes from need, and the du'a that comes from a real recognition that you are fakir, that you are nothing, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani. He is the one who has everything. 
and in his hand is the dominion of the heavens and the earth. There's nothing that you could want that he can't give you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it's tangible or intangible. And so that dua that comes from a real recognition of your need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the dua that is most likely to get accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. And then today's dua, the part that we took, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-jubin wa a'udhu bika min al-bukhul. It's pretty easy, memorize it inshallah ta'ala. And then we'll pick up on the rest of the dua tomorrow. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to cover chapter 11 from Kitab al tawheed Now, Chapter number 11. Make no animal sacrifice for Allah in the place where sacrifice is made for other than Allah. Okay, okay. Yesterday, we talked about slaughtering. And we said that slaughtering was four types. Anybody remember them? Huh? Okay, yes. Number one, in the name of Allah, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, when we say for the sake of Allah azza wa jalla, it is a sacrifice. It, it's not intended for the meat. You can eat from it. Uh, you can give away, you know, what you want from it. But that is not the intention of the sacrifice. It's in the name of Allah, and it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip, the second type. Yes. Okay, in the name of Allah, but for the sake of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the person may say Bismillah on his tongue, but he is actually intending this as a qurb or as a, as a means of devotion to something else other than, other, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip, number three. Yes. Right? For other than Allah. Now, in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for other than Allah. And this is still done today commonly amongst the mushrikeen where they slaughter in the name of whatever idol it is that they are slaughtering for. Like the fourth type, in the name of Allah for some permissible purpose. It's not a sacrifice. It's in, what's intended from it is, is the meat. What's intended from it is the meat. Okay, so in this chapter, that chapter dealt with the actual slaughter itself. This chapter deals with where the slaughter takes place. Okay, and this is actually a, an important point to note because there are some other things that I think are directly related to it that we may deal with on a, you know, on a, on a fairly uh, consistent basis. So the title is La Yudbahu Lillah Bi Makan and Yudbahu Fihi Li Ghayrillah. Or La Yadbah, there's two ways that you can say it. Lillah Bi Makan and Yudbahu Fihi Li Ghayrillah. That is, that no sacrifice for Allah, that's category number one. No sacrifice for Allah is to be made in a place where sacrifice to other than Allah is made. Okay? In other words, it is not permissible for a believer in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person of Tawheed, his slaughtering, the actual slaughter itself is in the name of Allah, and it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That part is fine, but he cannot do it in a place where other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sacrificed for. So, and it's similar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَىٰ النُّسُبِ وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَىٰ النُّسُبِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah when he, in the very beginning of Ma'idah, the, the third ayah, when he starts talking about the type of meat that you cannot eat, the type of meat that you can't eat, he says, وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَىٰ النُّسُبِ That which has been uh, uh, slaughtered, at the altars, yeah, I mean the, the, uh, the altars of the idolaters. So they have some type of pillars that they may set up where they slaughter. That which was slaughtered at the altar is not permissible to eat. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his tafsir, he says, even if it was slaughtered in the name of Allah. The issue is not how it was slaughtered, it's what? Where it was slaughtered. Where it was slaughtered, all right? So, yeah, and, and nobody, nobody's going to come and say if a person slaughters for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this type of place, that it should, at the above, takes him outside of the fold of Islam. No, but we'll see why it is prohibited 
Ta'ala as we uh, go a little bit through uh, the chapter, inshallah ta'ala. So, the, uh, the, the point here from the chapter heading is simply to, to understand that you cannot slaughter in these places. Tight. There are two reasons that the, the scholars mention, and then inshallah ta'ala will get down to the proofs, which are the one eye and one hadith. But there are two main reasons why you cannot slaughter at this place. The first is because it constitutes imitation of the mushrikeen. I mean, this is a place where it is known that they sacrifice. So why would a believer go to that place and sacrifice? That is external imitation. And there's a general rule in Islam. As a matter of fact, it's a general rule of life. You know how we say imitation is the highest form of what? Of flattery. Imitation. It's the fact that somebody copies you in doing something is a form of flattery. It shows that they, that they like what you are doing. And so even if a believer doesn't have that intention, the external imi imitation of the idolaters gradually will lead to some type of internal agreement. All right? And Shaykh al-Islam al-Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala he has a, an entire book dedicated to that topic uh, of imitating the non-Muslims. Anybody know the name of that book? Iqtida Sirat al mustaqim Okay? And that book is extremely important, especially for students of knowledge, to, to go over. The, the, the issue here is what? That external imitation usually leads to what? Some type of internal agreement, camaraderie, subhanAllah, think about it, okay, uh, think about how a police officer looks at you when you're wearing a thobe, like, what's, what's the difference between you and him, maybe he's Muslim, all that's different is you're wearing a thobe, he's wearing a, a police uniform, like, if you took your thobe off and you put on a police uniform, what would he do? Give you all types of greetings and that, based on what? Based on the, the external. The external has a major effect on the, think about, think about your child now. Your child, how he behaves, okay. You buy him a camouflage outfit and he puts it on. What's he start doing right away? He turns into a military, uh, uh, you know, he turns, He's from the army, from the marines, right away, as soon as he puts the, puts the outfit on. Because that external has an, inf has an effect on the internal, and we shouldn't deny it. I mean, this is common sense. A lot of people say, it doesn't matter what I wear. No, it does matter what you wear. It does. And so, it's, it's important that we, that we recognize this. Again, we're not talking about here, oh, it's, it's haram to wear, you know, a suit and a tie or anything like that. No, we, we can, that's a totally different discussion. We're not talking about that. The, the, what we're talking about here is not denying the fact that external imitation does lead to, even if it's over time and even if it's gradual, some type of internal agreement, okay? So that's number one. That's why you don't slaughter where it is known that the mushriki or the idolaters sacrifice for their gods, their deities. Right? That's the first thing. The, the second thing, the second reason, is that you want to cut off all doors, all avenues that lead to shirk. So as we talked about yesterday, category, categories two and three, slaughtering in the name of Allah but for other than Allah, or slaughtering in other than the name of Allah for other than Allah, that both of these are considered to be major forms of shirk because sacrificing is worship and to dedicate worship to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? It's shirk. So, you, Islam has come to cut off the avenues that lead to shirk. And here, even though this person is slaughtering in the name of Allah, he's res he resembles what? He's resembling the people who are slaughtering for their deities. And so we wouldn't want somebody now to copy this Muslim who's doing it and do it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore he has been a cause of leading someone else to shirk. 
All right? So you stay away from those places where other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worship. This is what is being covered uh, in this particular chapter. And the author says, bimakanin. He says, a place. And um, here, what I, what, I, what I think is important to mention is that there are two types of places being referred to. One is an exact location, a precise location. This particular place on the map is where these idolaters sacrifice for their deities. That's one type of place. The other type of place is not an exact location, but it takes on a description. So for example, it was common practice up until not too long ago. And I'm not talking about 300 years ago, less than that. It was common practice that if someone was sick, that a family member, amongst the Arabs, that a family member would take a sheep to where they were, to their house or wherever it is that they were being treated for their sickness, and they would slaughter the sheep at that particular place. Do you know why? Because they believed that it was the jinn that got the person sick. And so they were slaughtering for the jinn as a means of telling the jinn to, okay, leave him alone now. We've sacrificed for you, which is no doubt shirk etba. And it's a major form of shirk. It takes that person outside of the fold of Islam. <coughs> this is not an exact location. It's a location based on description. In other words, close to someone who is sick. So if that was prevalent in a society, then a believer should not go slaughter for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that place because it's resembling the acts of those who have committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We clear now on that part? Tight. Let's go to the proofs. There are two proofs that the author mentions. One is an ayah and the other is a hadith. The statement of Allah be exalted. Do not stand in it. La, la taqum fihi. لا تقم فيه أبدا لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب المطهرين 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 Do not stand in it ever A mosque founded upon piety from the first day is worthier of your standing in it All right, let's follow Let's follow this. What does this have to do with slaughter? Follow it step by step. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not stand in it ever. What does it refer to? Do not stand in it ever. Huh? Masjid al-Dirab. Masjid al-Dirab. Okay. So that, that's mentioned in the ayah previous or prior to, to this ayah. Do not stand in it ever. Allah is telling his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not stand in that masjid. That masjid was known as Masjid al dirar It was built near Masjid Quba. Okay? Built close to Masjid Quba, which is that direction, south. And it was built by a munafiq who went by the Kunya Abu Amir and his uh, cohorts, if you will. They built this masjid, even though it was right by Masjid Quba. It was right by Masjid Quba. And they built it claiming, claiming that, oh, they just want to make it you know, easier for people to pray and so on and so forth. But he was actually telling them to build their base. This was going to be the base from which they used to attack the Prophet والسلام, and his companions. And he went, to, he went off to Sham, uh, you know, uh, greater Syria, and they stayed behind building this masjid. And so they wanted the Prophet ﷺ to pray in their masjid. Why do you think that is? Validation. To give them credibility. Yes, you know, we're really building this, this masjid for Allah. And Allah just said, La taqum fihi abada. <coughs> Don't you ever, ever stand in that place, in that masjid. A masjid, the masjid that was established upon taqwa from the first day, 
has more right that you stand in it. It's worthier of your standing in it. It's like two things that need to be mentioned here. That masjid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa not to stand in, he also describes it as being built for muharabah of Allah and his messenger, to, to, to go to war with Allah and his messenger. And so the masjid was established for ma'asiyah, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite of a taqwa. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the masjid that has been established upon taqwa has more of a right that you do what? That you stand in it. It's worthy of your standing in it. And that masjid that has been established upon taqwa, the scholars of tafsir, some of them say masjid Quba. Why? Because masjid Quba was the first masjid that was built here in Medina. And the majority of them say it is the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The masjid that we're in, this is the masjid that is Ussi Sa'ad al taqwa that was built upon at taqwa And neither, and both of them were established upon taqwa So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that you have, that it's worthier of your standing in it. Nah, feed it. Nah. No, 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 Kemal uh, uh, translation. And it are men who love to be purified. And yes. Allah loves those who purify themselves. Right. In that masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as in meaning masjid Quba or in masjid Nabawi, there are men who like to purify themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the mutahirin, those who, who purify themselves. Abu Aliya, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great tabi'in, he said, it is a good thing to purify yourself with water. Purify yourself with water, wudu and ghusl and so forth. He said, but, the, but those who purify themselves in this ayah are those who purify themselves from sin. They purify themselves from sin. And so when we think about purification, we shouldn't just think about the ritual purification or the purification that is physical, but we should also recognize that spiritual purification of purifying oneself from sin. Tayyip, this particular ayah, does it mention anything about sacrificing? No? Does it mention anything about not sacrificing in a place where the idolaters sacrifice? Not directly, not directly, but there's a clear PS here. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ was prohibited from standing in a place that had been what? That had been built for the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, and so he was prohibited, la ta kum fihi abadat, don't stand in it. Uh, that word standing usually means what? A lot of times, or a lot of times when we hear it. In, like for example, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever stands Ramadan, Iman and Wahti Sabah, with true faith and seeking Allah's reward, Allah will forgive him of his sins. It means you stand up the whole month of Ramadan, you don't sit down, you don't go to sleep, you just stand up the whole time. What's it mean? It means to what? Pray. It means prayer. Whoever stands, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Layla Tal Qadr. Iman and Wahti Sabah. Ufiro Lahu Man Taqaddama. And then be. Whoever stands in the night, uh, Layla Tal Qadr, with the true faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking his reward, he will be forgiven for all of his previous sins. It means he stands up the entire night. It means he what? He prays. La ta kum fihi abadah. Meaning don't ever pray in that masjid. So the same way that the Prophet ﷺ was prohibited from worshipping Allah, the Prophet's prayer was going to be for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course. The same way he was prohibited from praying to Allah in a place that had been established for the disobedience of Allah, is the same way you should not do an act of worship for Allah in a place that was established for disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including sacrifice. So you should not sacrifice to Allah in a place that has, that has been established for the worship of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think the analogy is clear. Similarly, our Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he said, لا تجلسوا على القبور ولا تصلوا إليها. Sahih. Sahih Bukhari. Don't sit on the graves and do not pray 
to them. Don't pray in the direction. Sorry. Don't pray in the direction of the grapes. Play. Don't pray to who in the direction of the grapes? Don't pray to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the direction of the grapes. So that the outside appearance is not that you are praying to the grapes. Because there are people who pray to the grapes. And so the Prophet sallallahu does not want us to imitate those people and he doesn't want there to be any confusion from the external perspective and I, this is important that we understand this this point because we're not talking about direct forms of shirk here but we're talking about things that may lead to shirk and Islam cuts those avenues it closes those doors it's, it's actually one of the objectives of the sharia to cut those doors that lead to that which is haram. Thabit ibn Baha radiallahu anhu said, a man made a vow to sacrifice a camel at a place called Buwana. So he asked the Prophet about it. He said, did the place have any idol of Jahiliya which was worshipped there? The answer is right, no. Notice the first question. Let's take, a, let's take a step back and go back to the beginning of Hadith. Thabit ibn Baha radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said that a man uh, made a vow to slaughter a camel at a place known as Buana. Buana is south of Mecca. And so he went to the Prophet والسلام, and he's anyway he was questioning, you know, should he fulfill this vow that he made? Like, uh, have any of you heard people make vows before? Huh? Have any of you heard people make vows before? Why do people usually make vows? They want something from they want something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they say, Oh Allah, if you cure my mother, I'll fast for you know a month. Or I'll fast for two months, I'll fast three months out the year or something like that. And tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about the ruling of vows and these type of things. Because it's the next chapter. I just want you to understand the concept of a vow. So this man made a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would slaughter a camel, that he would sacrifice a camel at Buana, which is this place south of Mecca. So the Prophet sallallahu says to him, listen, listen to this question clearly. Read the question again. What did he say to him? Did the place have any idol of Jahiliya which was worshipped there? Listen to that. The Prophet said, is that where you're talking about slaughtering this camel, is, was this a place where the Mushriku used to slaughter their animals? Is this where they used to sacrifice for their gods? That's the first question. Yes. Second question. They answered no. The Prophet asked again, did the believers hold any of their Eid? Did the believers? That's what it said. Did the disbelievers hold any of their Eid's recurring festivities there? They answered So no. the second question is what? Is this a place where they used to hold their festivities? The, the Mushriki. Okay? The problem, and, they, and they said? They, they said no. They answered no. They answered no. Okay. So the question to the Prophet was about what? Fulfilling a a vow. But before the Prophet answered that question, he wanted to make sure that this place, what? Didn't have any any sacrificial worship to idols that was being done there. And it wasn't a place where the Mushrikeen held their festivities. So then the Prophet answered the question and he said, Allah's Messenger then said, fulfill your vow. Verily, there is no fulfilling of a vow made in disobedience to Allah. Stop there. He said what? Fulfill your vow. For there is no fulfillment of a vow that was made in disobedience to Allah. In other words, had that place been a place where idols were sacrificed, Afwan, where sacrifice was made to idols, or where the festivities of the idolaters were performed, 
then that would be disobedience to slaughter in that place and therefore you would not have to fulfill that vow. Even though fulfilling vows is obligation. If you make a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have now made that thing obligatory upon yourself. Now, nor is there. Nor one that is beyond a person's capacity. Right, a person does not fulfill a vow that is beyond their capacity. And this hadith was collected by? Supported by Abu Dawood and it fulfills the conditions of verification of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Okay, so this hadith was just sahih. I want us to kind of grasp what's going on here. Thabit ibn Lahat says that this man came to the Prophet وسلم, and asked him about slaughtering this animal in Buana. Okay. The reason why the Prophet والسلام, asks him is because that seems abnormal that you would make most people if they if they vow, right? Uh, they say, oh Allah, if you cure my uh, father, for example, I'll slaughter an animal, or I'll slaughter a sheep. It doesn't say at a specific place. Or they might say, I'll make i'tikaf in al-masjid al-haram. Okay, why did they specify al-masjid al-haram? Because it's a place that is, that is sacred. It's a place that at least as Muslims, we hold it to be a sacred place. So it seemed odd that this person is saying, I'm going to sacrifice at Buana. What exactly is it about Buana? In some other narrations of the hadith, the Prophet Wasallam asked the man, Afi qalbika shaykhin al-jahiliyyah. It, it was when you made this vow, was it because there was something about jahiliyyah in your heart? In other words, was this a place that the people used to venerate in jahiliyyah? And so the man said, no. And so the Prophet Wasallam said, oh, fi, be nadri, then fulfill your vow. That the point here is that the Prophet Sallallahu specifically asked, is this a place where they what? Where they slaughter, where they sacrifice for their idols. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi described it as being ma'asiyah, fi ma'asiyah tillah. So to slaughter at that place, even if it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, it is considered to be disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Likewise, the Eid. And why do you think the Prophet Sallallahu asked about the Eid? Did the Mushrikun, did the Mushrikun, were they like uh, Jews and they had temples? Mushrikun at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. I mean, there was the Kaaba, which, they, which, where, which is where they had many of their idols. But they didn't have those kind of temples. Did they have churches like Christians? No. So the Prophet ﷺ was asking, did they take this place as an Eid? Because what happens on the Eid? People do what? Religious acts of worship. In general. It's not always the case. But there are acts of worship that are done. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make sure that this was not a place where idolatrous acts of worship were performed. Because if that was the case, then as Muslims we should avoid it. As Muslims, we should avoid it. Alright? Now, uh, just to clarify, in Islam we have how many Eids? Two. And two only. And anything other than that is considered to be an Eid of Jahiliyyah. Outside of the guidance of Islam. And an Eid, as the scholars have mentioned, is anything that recurs on a normal basis, annually, monthly, weekly. We have a weekly Eid too. Friday. Okay. So it, it, re, it is recurrent. The second thing is that there is a public gathering. Ijtima'un an. Okay, that there's a public gathering for it. And the third thing is that there's some normal activity, normally worship, but not necessarily, that is performed. All right? Those three things constitute an Eid. I'm going to bring up an issue, and I want us to look at it, because it's become prevalent amongst Muslims, and then we can revisit it in detail at a later time, inshallah.
is celebrating a birthday considered to be an Eid. Okay, so it meets that condition. It's annually. Let's keep going. Next thing is that there's an ishtima'a, that there's a public gathering for it. Is there a public gathering for a birthday? It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not something that is celebrated. It's not something that is celebrated by society. That's why a birthday can be every day. It's not yours, but your neighbors, your cousins, your aunts, right? It's not something that is celebrated by society. When celebrated by society, it would meet that second condition, which is that it is a ishtima'a, that it's a public gathering. So we've fallen out of the category of it being an Eid. Does that now mean that it's permissible? Just because it's not considered to be an Eid does not mean that it is permissible to celebrate it. And that is because you have to look at other factors when we talk about celebrations. You sometimes look at the origin of that celebration. You may also look at the fact that uh, does there, it doesn't have an element of imitating the non-Muslims in a manner that is not permissible, so on and so forth. So there are multiple things that you look at when we talk about new things that have that, that come up, okay, new holidays, if you will, and the permissibility or impermissibility of a Muslim participating uh, in those days. At the end of the day, we're Muslim, and we should be proud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us two Eids, and we should suffice ourselves for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as Muslims, and it's enough for us. And we don't need to imitate other people's cultures and make it, make it a part of our culture when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that which is superior. And what happens many times is because of our inferiority complex as Muslims who have been colonized for hundreds of years and who have adopted this theory that they are better than us and we therefore adopt their culture, we then now instill this in our children to the point that they look forward to their birthdays much more than they look forward to the Eid on the other than that. And so we shouldn't even have these kind of debates, permissible, not permissible. Our deen, our practice of our deen, our sticking to our deen constitutes our honor, both in this life and in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last issue that I want to deal with as it relates to this particular chapter is something that many of you may face, especially if you live in the lands of non-Muslims. That is, that there may be regulations that prevent you from doing your adha, your uthiya, your hadi, or any of these other things. You can't just do it in your backyard. You have to go to a slaughterhouse. And that slaughterhouse may be owned by non-Muslims. And they're slaughtering in their slaughterhouses. Can you, can you slaughter in the same slaughterhouses that they slaughter in? even though we've been prohibited from sacrificing in a place where other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sacrificed for. You understand the question? So sometimes we may have there's rules and laws and society and regulations. You can't just buy your sheep, take it to your backyard and slaughter it on Eid al-Adha. The neighbors may call, you know, l and I or whatever. I don't know what you call it in different places. Animal control or whatever else. So, if our only option is to slaughter at a slaughterhouse that's owned by non-Muslims, can we do it or not? Understand the question? The answer is yes, you can. And the reason why, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is because they're not sacrificing for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those places. Those are commercial slaughterhouses. They're doing it for the meat. And you remember we said there's four categories. The first three are the ones we have to worry about sacrificing. The last one is for meat. So even if they're slaughtering, you know, and other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever way they do it, they're not sacrificing. Those are not sacrifices. Those are slaughtering. That's simply slaughtering for meat. And therefore, we can go there and sacrifice because it is not known to be a, a place of, of religious dedication uh, or veneration in the first place. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa tuku ilayk. One question always turns into 10. What was the question from the day before yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. So the questioner is talking about uh, issues related to a tabarruk, which is seeking blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but specifically reading the Quran, which is blessed, reading it into, uh, for example, a glass of water, and then having someone else uh, drink that water. That's the first part of the question. And the, and the second part is writing the Quran down on a piece of paper and then using the Quran uh, to put on one's body. And I, I guess you weren't here when we talked about Rukya and Ambulance because I discussed both of them in some, some detail. I'll give you the quick answer right now, which is that as was mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that can bless something or put blessing in something. All blessing comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way that we know that something is blessed is through revelation. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not spoken to any of us directly. So we know from his revelation what he has blessed. We know that he blessed the Kaaba, we know that Mecca is blessed, we know that the Quran is blessed, we know that the Prophet والسلام, is blessed, and so on. Uh, secondly, the way that we seek blessings from the Quran, from the Kaaba, from whatever else we know has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has to be in accordance to teachings of our Prophet So the issue of Rukia, for example, and a person reading Quran over someone else is something that was done during the lifetime of the Prophet it was done by the companions to other companions. It was done by the companions to Kuffar. They performed Rukya over non-Muslims. It was the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and had performed Rukya for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. None of that, to my knowledge, included reading the Quran into a glass of water. However, however, that has been established as the practice of some of the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum and it became more widespread during the time of the tabi'een. When you find that the companions did something, not just one, but there are multiple companions who have done something, it is impossible to come and say that that thing is an innovation. There's no doubt that they either took it directly from the teachings of the Prophet that is that he taught, instructed them to do that, or they understood that from the general texts of Islam. And their understanding is what we strive to follow as believers. We want to understand the text the way that they understood it. So the fact that that was practiced, that the Quran was read into water, and that water uh, was given to others to drink, then that's a clear indication of the permissibility of that particular practice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As for uh, writing down the Quran and putting it, you know, as an amulet, wearing it around one's neck, or uh, uh, putting it as a, 
you know, a bracelet or whatever other form that a person may use as a talisman or, or amulet, then that, as we mentioned, there is a difference of opinion amongst the companions themselves. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that a person may wear an amulet with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ba'da nuzul al after a person has been afflicted with something, not prior to. But many of the other companions like Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu in his entire school, uh, they held that wearing any type of amulet from the Quran or other than the Quran was impermissible. Uh, again, as we mentioned in the previous lessons, when there's a difference of opinion amongst the companions, it is our duty as Muslims to follow what we believe is closest to the text. And what the text indicate here is that a person should not wear an amulet at all. Uh, that a person should not hang anything around their neck or wear it around their arm. That's what the text seemed to indicate. At the same time, because that difference of opinion was amongst the companions, it is not permissible for us to come now and be super strict with those who follow another opinion that was adopted by the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not to mention in this case, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and had the mother of the believers and the closest of all people to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in terms of proximity. And so here, uh, in this case, though we say that we should not do that and that we should avoid it, if someone does it, as long as it is strictly from the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else, then it's not something that we should be, uh, you know, again, it's not something that we should be ultra strict with them about, though we should advise them and tell them that that which is closer to the text of the Prophet who mentioned in the authentic hadith, uh, and not to, to qallid watara, yani not to wear anything around your neck as a charm. Those general statements of the Prophet ﷺ should be understood to leave it off all types of amulets. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. The rest of the questions, inshallah ta'ala, will have to postpone until uh, tomorrow. I'll try to make the lesson shorter tomorrow and more time for questions at the end. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shalom alayhi wa ta'ala.